Type 3 Radio. And we're back! Ooh, hi. Yeah. Good evening. <laughs> All right. So, uh, everybody back in here? Everybody's yes. not. We're back. We're back. Yeah, everybody? Hello. All right. Hey. All right. All right. It is uh, always a pleasure to have Chuck Hawley from creepycleveland.net. Is it still .net, Chuck? Is that nice. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm just, I was fairly certain it was because I had it up earlier today, but then again, things change so fast that, you know, you never really know. I tried grabbing creepycleveland.com a couple years ago, and that domain name's registered somebody out in California. And as far as I can tell, he's never done anything with the site and won't sell it. And I'm sure you know, for... Uh, I mean, if you go to .com, you won't go anywhere. .net is where it's at. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, uh, we had you back on uh, earlier this year in March, and... Tis the season for hauntings and all that such stuff, so. Yes, indeed. And then it's a dark and stormy night on the North Coast. I think it's time for some ghost stories. Oh, yeah. But uh, do you want um, do you want to quick go into the history of the website or, you know? Sure. Well, uh, I said uh, back in earlier in the year uh, that I've been running Creepy Cleveland. The first iteration I could find, archive.org, I think, has an old, old, old uh, image of the first Creepy Cleveland around 2001. I've uh, been running the site for just over 10 years, and I collect ghost stories. Um, I don't tend to go out. I've, I've been to many of these places, and I have had some of my own experiences, but I'm not like a ghost hunter. I don't go out there with all my equipment and look for ghosts and try to prove anything. I'm the Internet campfire when everybody has a few beers and sits around and says, oh, I got this story to tell you, that's what I want. Uh, those are the stories I collect. So you're the moderator. People send me, right. Well, no, you're not even, because, I mean, there's, I think there's maybe even one story ever that I can publish, for the most part. And, and people have also asked, well, creepy Cleveland, how big is Cleveland? I mean, I'm taking stories from Toledo and everything else. I mean, there is there is a, a, a limit to some, to some extent, but for the most part, I just kind of want to hear the story. So if it happened in Ohio... More than likely, I'll probably publish it. But uh, I am interested in mostly Northeast Ohio, the Cleveland area, and other places around there. Anything, anything you've heard of. Um, over the years, we've I've I've come across. Uh, there tends to be a lot of stories from the same certain places leading into what we're going to do tonight. And there's been a lot of like one-off stories, like bizarre once in a lifetime things that t- nobody's ever heard of, and. Just things that I'm not even sure people are. I think maybe they're making it up just to get on the website. And then if that's true and it's a good story, then that's cool too. But I switched to the blog format a couple of years ago because I noticed that the best part of the of the website was the stories, and the best thing about the stories was letting other people respond. Because like somebody put up a, a story that was totally bogus, somebody could comment and say, "I've been there." Well, somebody actually wrote the site wrote the site and said that uh, Helltown was the site that they filmed uh, Children of the Corn. I published it, and the, within a, within a day, I had a comment with a link for Internet Movie Database disproving it, saying no, nope, it never happened. <laughs> so that's what I want to do: is I want to get up there and I want to get people saying, "Hey, if you if you got to do with balls, just tell me the story and support it. I'll publish it." But if you're going to you know post stuff that's obviously debunked, somebody's going to catch on it. So uh, I've got a I've got a couple thousand stories, and just recently I've moved everything back to the blogger format, and I've. Uh, Started using uh, Google's. I've, I registered Creepy Cleveland at Gmail a number of years ago, and I started using the Google account. And the recent changes to Creepy Cleveland, I now have an extensive uh, photo collection that I'm still sort of sifting through. I have uh, I'm getting a pretty decent document collection using Google Docs. Uh, it is shared and available to all. Usually, collections of uh, articles from like Cleveland.com or old. Uh, Internet newspapers where they did an article about something, one of the haunted places or whatever, which they tend to do like every year around this time. But by November, by Thanksgiving, you can't find it or there it's gone. It rolls off the site. I try to grab some of those articles and I give full credit to their authors and everything. I don't want to claim I did these, but I keep these things. And for the longest time, I didn't know where to put them on the site. So what I started doing is shoving them in a separate section using Google Docs. Um, I have, I have the creepy, the creepy calendar up there. If you were following Creepy Cleveland, went to the site and looked in the sidebar, you saw that tonight's interview on Type 3 TV was on the creepy calendar. Yep. You can go ahead and subscribe to the creepy calendar. And I put, so far, there's only a handful of things up there, all the pagan holidays of the year, 
things like tonight, uh, significant haunted houses that I've been to or that I like, they're open. You just want to pick back up where you left off? Sorry, Chuck. No, not a problem. What was the, uh, what was the last thing you heard? Uh, be honest with you. Well, I think we I, just... I, think, I, I think I heard somebody say okay or uh-huh, some about creepy calendar, and I was just almost done at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started going over the changes to the site. Right. I think that's, yeah, that's where you left off, because I think as soon as that happened, everybody went into panic mode, like, where, what the hell just All happened? Right. And uh, thank you, AT and T. We're sp- Type Three is sponsored by AT and T. We'll yeah. t- give you internet and take it away. <laughs> so you well, that, bill, was, right? that was pretty much it. I was wrapping up. Uh, I think the last thing I said when I realized no one was there anymore was uh, tonight. We we're here to count down the top ten legends uh, as voted on by visitors to Creepy Cleveland. And uh, I was wondering when you wanted to start. Well, let's start right <laughs> now. If AT and T will let us, we need a job. All right. Well, let's Let's give it a shot, and we'll start at the bottom. And uh, I had, like I said, I had about 60 votes, not as many as I really would have wanted, but for whatever reason, I just, I don't know, people people love to give their opinions on the Internet. I don't know why they didn't vote more. But starting at the bottom of the list, with zero votes, <laughs> ooh, ooh, not very creepy, apparently, is Gray's Armory. We were yeah, just talking about there. that. Guys, he was there for a dance. Here's you guys talking about that earlier. I uh, uh, here's took my, my little, shooting range test down there. Here's my little spiel on Gray's Armory. In the mid-19th century, all major U.S. cities had their own volunteer militias with their own uniforms, flags, weapons, and bands. In Cleveland, this unit was called the Cleveland Grays, after their gray uniforms. They were the first Cleveland group to leave to fight in the Civil War. Later, the Cleveland Grays rode with General Pershing in the Spanish-American War and with the 145th Infantry in 1916. The group built a huge sandstone castle in 1893 as the Grays' headquarters. The five-story fortress still stands in downtown Cleveland near Erie Street Cemetery. It features a ballroom, a shooting range, a library, and walls and walls of military memorabilia. Visitors and staff at the armory have claimed to hear footsteps when no one was present, as well as seeing Civil War-era apparitions. By all accounts, the ghosts seem friendly. Now, that's my little spiel on Gray's Armory. I have been, uh, I've only gotten a handful, as in, like, two or three stories about Gray's Armory. One, uh, one fellow sent me a ton of photographs, which was really interesting, although nothing, of, nothing about them suggests anything haunted. But it was, as far as the, the history and the memorabilia and all the stuff that's around Gray's Armory, there is uh, definitely, I guess, the potential. But uh, as far as being haunted, it's known to be haunted, but no one's come forward with any kind of ghost stories. What have you guys ever heard about Gray's Armory? I actually took my uh, concealed carry uh, test down there in the shooting range. And uh, I we heard some footsteps upstairs. And there was only 12 of us downstairs, like instructors and all. Nobody was outside, you know, because you have to do it, like, all in a group. They're very controlled and shit, so. But uh, we, heard, we heard some footsteps upstairs, and it, I don't know, you think it's like an old building, so you really don't pay any mind to it, but it's a little creepy inside and out. Might be those downtown Cleveland rats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's over 100 years old. And the the history of the of the building certainly suggests that uh, people probably found it a place of comfort. Maybe I mean I, I can't think like a I mean like a a hospital or or something like that where people probably died there. I, I don't know if that's likely, but I mean you figure all the, all the memorabilia and stuff. I mean this is obviously the artifacts of people that have died. And if you're thinking of ghosts from that point of view, I mean are ghosts attracted to that? Is that what they are? All accounts, like I said, have, that I've read have said the ghosts are friendly. No one's ever given a name. No one ever has a uh, one specific spirit that they claim that they that hangs out there. But uh, from all accounts, I've heard that you know Gray's Armory is haunted. But when I threw it up on the uh, on the website, it got no votes. Nobody, everyone seems to uh, unanimously agree. Oh yeah, I've heard about that. It's haunted, but nobody has a first hand story, and nobody can tell me anything about it. You know, I was. It, it made me think of another place, but I want. I don't want to ask you. I. I would rather just wait as you spew it out to see if it's on the list or not. But um, okay. So, um, what, what's that, 
Joe? Num- number two? Number two? Yeah, number eight? On, number, number nine. Two? No, <laughs> number nine. nine. Yes. Number I want to get to two already. <laughs> number nine. All right. Uh, we had, we had a, a tie for uh, the basement here. Coming in with the second and uh, only other zero vote entry was South Bay Bessie. Lake Erie's western basin has become a host of yet another aquatic serpent in the world. Not surprisingly, because the major majority of these inhabited inland waterways within the northern hemisphere lay claim to some sort of monster. There have been many explanations as to the sightings. The most nor- notable is the prehistorical sturgeon, which can easily go up to 300 pounds and has been known to reach 20 feet, 200 pounds, and 100 years old. However, it must be noted that they are bottom fish and rarely seen on the surface. But how often could one see a serpent? South Bay Bessie has stirred quite a wonder in northern Ohio since the mid-1980s. John Schaffner, editor of the Ottawa County Beacon, has been the focal point of data collection. He has a, he had a hot, uh, he was running a hotline that produced reports dating back 30 years. The majority of the reports depict the same basic description, a 30 to 50 foot long snake-like creature about as, uh, about as big around as like a bowling ball. The reported creature seems to appear when the water is calm. Hmm. Now, Cleveland has, does Lake Erie have its own Loch Ness? I'm not sure. Uh, I've heard of uh, Loch Ness, obviously. We've heard of Pogo Pogo. I think that was Canadian. Uh, but South Bay Bessie started creeping into the news, like I said, back in the 80s. I do have one video. It's, I think I'll post it maybe after tonight on uh, Creepy Cleveland. It is horrible. I mean, it's, it's literally like a five-second video that looks like somebody took with a very early model cell phone of what could conceivably be something 50 feet out in the water that they claim is South Bay Bessie. But there's been numerous, I mean, while there's been no photographic or video evidence, there's been numerous, this, this John Schaffner, I've caught a couple of his web pages, there's been numerous sightings, numerous people describing all fishermen, of course, or people making the, uh, the trip back and forth to, like, South Bass Island, that have seen this thing. And, of course, nobody gets a good look at it. You only see a little section of it at a time, and then it goes back under. Can a, a monster like that uh, exist, and can it survive the Lake Erie winters? Questions up to you. Once again, uh, the subject got zero votes. <laughs> a lot of people have heard of it, but no one seems to have had any experience. Well, yeah. I open the floor. <laughs> I mean, and then, you know, obviously we have, what, a beer named after this and uh, a team you know, our hockey team, I'm sure, is uh, maybe s- supposedly named after this folklore. So, right. You, you said that it got I mean, big in the '80s. I don't. I don't well, see I'm, it happening. I I, thought, I was working today. I was trying to get my notes in order and trying to get my dates so that I, I didn't sound like a total fool tonight. And the <laughs> one website that I was looking at was uh, dated '91. '91. And '91. I'll have. I can post the link up on uh, Creepy Cleveland, but the the link had stories going back, like you said, about 30 years, and each little, each description was like a, a very short paragraph, maybe a couple sentences, was this is the guy's name and this is what he saw. And it was from that, that editor of that uh, Ottawa newspaper who was collecting these sightings of these stories. And kind of like my own, kind of like Creepy Cleveland, just sitting back and waiting for people to come tell you stuff, on one hand, what would they gain from making up these sightings? And on the other hand, a lot of them seem to be describing something very odd, something very different, but all seem to be describing the same thing. So they're all talking about the same kind of creature. But with the number of and everything else and the technology and the, and the ubiquitous of, of cell phones and video cameras now, you'd think that there'd be only be more evidence of it. But either it died off or, you know, Back in the 90s or something, maybe they don't live forever, or maybe it never existed. But for some reason, I haven't heard much about it in, in the last several years. Yeah, that lake gets way too cold. Yeah, no, I I, I don't think just because, you know, uh, I think waves tend to, like, cast shadows and the way light hits it sometimes. Something, you know, it just might be an optical illusion, too, maybe. And a lot of drinking is done on Lake Erie. Let's, oh, yeah. let's be real. <laughs> especially at South Bay. Yeah, especially. <laughs> I do know. I don't I don't remember which one it was, but I do know that South Bay Bessie itself, the name, was the result of a contest. Uh, one of the county newspapers, maybe the Iowa one, I'd, I'd have to check, 
uh, hosted a contest to name Lake Erie Sea Serpent. So maybe in the in the, the rush of the excitement of, of naming a creature that nobody even knew existed and somebody came up with a name, uh, maybe that just sort of enhanced a bunch of, like you said, maybe a bunch of people out drinking on the lake, fishing, <laughs> saw something and said, actually, that's what it was. Now that they have a name for it, now they needed a, a creature to put the name with. All right, cool. And then let's let's go to. Uh, I wish I had like you know number seven. Ding, 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 <laughs> you know, like, it wouldn't work because we're on number eight. Yeah. Oh, we're on. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, number eight. Where's my? Oh, my notes are out. Okay, number eight. It's brought to you by AT and T. Sorry. <laughs> Coming in with one solitary vote. Sweet. I was kind of sad that this was only got one solitary vote, but it was enough to move it into eighth place was Squire's Castle. The Squire's Castle was actually intended to be a chalet when Fergus Squire decided he wanted wanted to build an English castle in the wilderness of Cleveland, Ohio. Fergus came to the United States from his homeland in England, bringing his wife with him. Apparently, Mrs. Squire was not at all happy out in the woods, and while temporarily living in the the chalet, she lost her mind. Uh Mrs. Squire's death, however, remains a mystery. Some say she died in the cell... Chalet, while others disagree. Paranormal activity has been reported at Squire's Castle for decades and continues today. Many have claimed to see the apparition of a woman walking past the second floor windows while she carried a lantern to light her way. What's so odd about that? There is no second floor. The castle is gutted. Also, it's believed that the same apparition is responsible for the screaming that has been heard by many at night when no other living person could be seen. Several other apparitions have been spotted roaming the grounds and surrounding wooded area, and many people have photographed numerous orbs about the place. Now, Squire's Castle, I've been out there a dozen times. It's one of our favorite little picnic areas. Uh, Every time we go out there, there always seems to be a wedding, too. There's somebody out there taking their wedding photos. Talking about a a wonderful photo background. My brother just got it. Never seen uh, Mrs. Squire out there. What's that, Joe? No, I was going to say, my brother... uh... It was like 13, 14 years ago. He got his uh, wedding. He got married out in front of Squire's Castle. Did you ever look at the picture, see if there's anything freaky in the background? Uh, no, but now after hearing this, I'm going to have to check it out. You might have some evidence there. I have one story, one particular story, and I, of course, I mean, it just seems the providence, you know. The picture the lady submitted was corrupted. It seemed like it got uh I don't know if it, it, it looks like a digital picture or something. It's not like it was a film picture that got developed badly. It was just a digital picture that got skewed. It is on the website, though, and you can find it there. She claims that uh, they were the only ones there, which is possible. I mean, it's not like the place is crowded all the time. They were the only ones there, and her two children were outside with her while she was taking the photograph. And in the photograph, you can distinctly see what appears to be a young boy, the silhouette of a young boy in the window. Now, Looking at the picture and without hearing the story, it's just a young boy sitting in the window. But she swears that there was nobody else in the castle at the time. That was kind of cool. I was nice. It was nice to get some sort of physical evidence and actually be able to see something, even if the story was hokey. Maybe she didn't see the kid running around and, and he just happened to be in, in her picture. But the vast majority of the uh, of the stories I've gotten in Creepy Cleveland are one of one of two things: either people calling to Berate me and tell me that Squire's Castle is not haunted. It never was haunted. Mrs. Squire didn't die there. Uh, that wasn't even the castle. It was only the gatehouse. The castle was supposed to be built further back in the woods, and it was never built because she did die, but she died in England, and, and Fergus Squire got sick of his and tired of his whole little experience out there and decided to sell the land to the Metro Parks. And I mean, there's a whole like, big story about it. The other side is a bunch of people telling me about how they don't believe it either, but, and it follows up with a story about how they were out there one night. There seems to be, most of the stories seem to have a chemical inducement. <laughs> there, was, uh, there was some smoking or some drinking happening, and then there was a ghost. Oh, so of course. those are good stories, too, but, I mean, how believable can they be? Right. <sighs> so, I've never been there. I, I've never even heard of the place until just now. Um, I'm more familiar with the Franklin's Castle, but... I'm uh I'm pleading ignorance on this one. What uh what side of Cleveland is Squire's Castle on? Squire Castle is in the North Chagrin Reservation of the Metro Parks. It's off Sun Center Road on uh it's on the east side. It's one of my favorite locations whenever we make the trip out there. My wife will 
get me to drive her to Squire's Castle if she agrees to stop by uh, Micro Center. It's out by the big <laughs> computer store. If you're a oh, big yeah. computer geek, I'll be there. Yeah. Computer store on Sound Center Road, just keep going straight down Sound Center to North Chagrin, follow the signs. And it is. It's literally just like the metro parks all over Cleveland. There's a number of, like, the nature centers and things like that. There's a number of uh, bigger, I don't want to say attractions, because it's not like you have to pay, but, I mean, there's a big pavilion out there and everything else, and it's a picnic area, and there's a giant green lawn. And, I mean, every time we've been out there, it's usually in the summer, it's, yeah, on a nice day, people out there playing frisbee and laying out and getting a tan. And like I said, there's a dozen times uh, wedding parties have been out there taking their pictures. And the, the castle, I mean, you can find pictures, Google image search. You can find pictures everywhere. The castle or the gatehouse, I guess, more technically, is beautiful. I mean, going, you can walk into it, and it has been gutted. You can see where it used to be two floors, and you can see where the cement work was actually drilled or broken out when the Metro Parks took over. And they made it sort of just this very decorative pavilion. It's not even, it doesn't even have a roof on it in all places. It's not, it's just sort of a, a, a novelty to look at. You, there's not really much to it anymore. But there's signs all over the place telling the story. Nothing about the haunted part, of course, but telling about Fergus and about what he did and the, the things that he did for Cleveland and all this stuff. So there is some deep history there, and it does indeed, you know, it has all the basis to have a cool ghost story. Now, whether there was a real ghost story that came over with it and got spread around, or if somebody discovered this castle and then decided to invent a ghost story to tack onto it, that's what I'm not sure of. Right. Right. All right, let's uh, let's keep it moving. Uh, let's go to number seven. Number seven. All right, there you go. Dun, dun, dun. Number seven, coming in with two votes. All right. Measly two votes. And this one I've never been to, but I've gotten, an, again, I've gotten enough information about Riders Inn in Painesville. That face in the second story window may just be the proprietor of the Riders Inn, the original owner, and she's been there for almost 100 years. The ghost of the third wife of the former owner of the inn, Miss Suzette, is said to haunt the Riders Inn. A protective sp- many tales have been told of Suzette's helpful, not hurtful nature. A functioning bed and breakfast and full restaurant, the Riders Inn hosts the tale of full candlelight dinners every Friday in October. Included in the evening is a tour of the inn, and guests are encouraged to bring their ghost stories. Now, the Riders Inn, uh, a few years back, I was on the, uh, I was involved in the uh, morning show with Robin Swoboda. She did her Halloween the ghost story. Yeah, she did different segments. I did a segment for uh, the Melon Heads in Helltown. And she did a segment with Riders Inn, and they actually, I was, you know, they, they filmed all the parts individually. Nobody ever met anybody. It wasn't until Halloween when I actually saw the show that I even saw the Riders Inn segment where they did an interview with the owner. And she went on to say most of the things that I just told you, that they're aware that there's a ghost there. They believe it's Suzette. That's what they call her. If it's not, that's what they call her. Um, she is helpful. There's been many a times when, like, the uh, the inn almost caught on fire, and uh, suddenly a phone call was placed, a 911 call was placed to the fire department, and there was nobody there. I mean, the, you know, the, the phone call was placed, but there was nobody actually that made the phone call. So for whatever reason, it alerted the fire department they got there in time. I mean, she's, she's, got, she's full of these stories. There's all these things where Suzette came around, but are Suzette's to be blamed for something that saved the inn. Um, they do seem to know, like I said, about Suzette, and they seem to be taking advantage of it. Uh, the tailful, what did I call it? The tailful candlelight dinners are operating every Friday, this Friday included, in October. Um, it includes dinner and, like I said, dinner, a music, some other, a four course dinner, and a whole bunch of, including a tour. It's like 60 bucks a person. I mean, they're making their money off Suzette. Now, I don't know if Suzette approves of this or not, but she's obviously out there, and a lot of people have seen her, a lot of people have known of her, and I think the owners of the inn are not shy about spreading the legend around. Right. She's going to be pissed. <laughs> Sooner or later, somebody's going to she's going to come and put some wrath on everybody that's making the dough. <laughs> I would assume so. It's another, it's another perfect story of a, of a building that's like 100 years old, over 100 years old. It's got some history. There, there's some documented history if you used to live there. Um, the third wife of this owner from, I don't know for sure, but I've, I've heard there's 
some unsavory stories about the first two wives. I'm not sure if there was some, you know, some animosity there or whatever, but for whatever reason, this, this the, the, the person they believe is haunting the inn now, Miss Suzette, uh, for whatever reason has taken a real shine to the restaurant and wants to see it, you know, continue to go on. And the owners, like I said, seem to be in agreement with this. You know, my question is, is that a lot of these, you know, uh, a lot of these places, you know, they have uh, somewhat, you know, of an old, an older style, very uh, what's what's the word I'm trying to Victorian looking or, you know, they've got history. To yeah, history to them. It's yeah. do you ever get anything that's like more of a contemporary location or you know what I mean, like something that you know, uh, like new haunting. yeah, like a newer like a newer place, like you know maybe something was built somewhere where, you know, it was you know the the old ancient Indian burial ground or anything like that or. You know, uh, somebody got you know killed somewhere, and they're you know three days later they show up. Well, yeah, I've gotten a handful of stories. I couldn't give you a number, but yes, I know what you're talking about. The, the problem with those stories is they're not popular. Popular in the sense that like everybody's heard of them. But yeah, I've heard I've gotten stories about there was a, an asylum out in Canal that wasn't. Hundreds of years old. I mean, there was some history there, but there used to be a, a hospital up at Canal Road. Um, I've heard stories about the jail downtown. Granted, again, not old, old building, but not you know, not like a hundred years old. Right, right. Um, the nurse in the woods story that I, I love to re- I love bringing that story up. That wound up being it was my favorite story, and then it wound up being my favorite favorite story after I found out it was true. And that was just because, I mean, it was a, a basic, to recap, it was a, a, this nurse was killed in the woods down by, uh, I like Memphis Kitty Park, out on Memphis Avenue down in that area, in, back in the woods. Oh, my girlfriend and lives over by I, there. Some guys had seen her one night, and we'll wonder if there was a couple guys. One of the guys saw her and asked the other guys that he was with if they saw her, too, and they're like, no, we don't know what you're talking about. You're, you're crazy. And they, they went on to find out that it, she was well-known around those parts. The guy down the street who was out walking his dog or watering his lawn or whatever overheard the guys arguing and, and told the story about the nurse. And I just thought it was such a great story that the, this guy that I can't even prove who he was, I lost his email address and I still got the story, sent me that story that was just so well told and it just had that great kind of, you know, the ghost thing and, and nobody saw her and then there was a little comeuppance at the end that, you know, that really did happen and blah, blah, blah. That was good enough. But then a year or two ago, I submitted that story to Charles Cassidy for use in his book, Cleveland Ghosts, and he got back to me. He did some research even further than I ever did, mostly because I hardly do any research. He did some research and found out that the story was true. He told me the nurse's name. He, there was police reports from Parma Hospital because she, uh, she worked at the hospital. There was police reports from, I think it was Parma, Parma Police or Brooklyn Police, I mean, this is all was true. I mean, there's, there's facts to corroborate the whole story. And that was something where you're talking about where somebody got killed and came, like, right back, maybe not three days later. But, I mean, that was just recent, just in the last 20 years. And that had no, like, big castle history or no 100-year-old or, you know, whatever imported history behind it. That was just something that just happened. And those stories are awesome. But the problem with those is that, you know, or I guess the thing that makes them so special is that only one person knows the story until they tell me, and hopefully then this I can get it on the site and tell a bunch of people. But it, it'll never make a top ten list because only one person ever experienced it. Right, right. But those are really good stories too. All right, and go ahead. Number six. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> so bad. Hey, what do you want from me? I'm not a recording. Big budget. <laughs> All right, number six. We we got we we have to throw a cemetery in here at some point. Number six is the Witch's Ball. Oh, yeah. In the Myrtle Hill Cemetery, one can find a large ball-shaped gravestone that supposedly rests atop the grave of a witch. Legend has it that the witch poisoned her family and disposed of their bodies in a well. Another version of the story claims she was killed when it was discovered that she was a witch. Today, people claim that the gravestone feels hot year-round, and on a moonlit night, if you're unlucky, you can see the witch sitting atop her ball. Well, the legend can be traced back to a rash of poisonings in the area back in the 1920s. A woman named Martha Wise was a well-known loony in those parks, and while she wasn't a witch, she did have a penchant for men, murder, and arson. 
During the holiday season of 1924, Martha twice poisoned her family with arsenic, killing three and sickening many others. When the autopsies revealed the cause of death, Martha was put on trial and convicted. She spent the rest of her days at Marysville Prison and died in 1971. According to the records there, she is buried on prison grounds. While there's a good chance that her victims are buried in Myrtle Hill Cemetery, the Witch's Ball remains an odd memoriam unconnected to the legend. But don't ask about the land beyond the woods. Now, that was my spiel about the Witch's Ball. The Witch's Ball is located off Route Field 3 in Valley City, um, just, no, just, just actually just north of 303, not quite as, I don't remember, now I think it's just not quite as far as 303. It's not hard to find. Um, it is still a functioning cemetery. It's still, you know, uh, don't go out there at night. It's still trespassing. It's go out there past dark, you know, dawn till dusk. But in the middle of the older section of the cemetery, you can't miss it when you pull in the cemetery, is a large ball. I mean, I'm talking three feet in diameter. On the base of the ball is etched a name, Stockskopf, which I imagine is the last name. How do you spell that? This, S-T-O-S-K-O-P-F, Stockskopf. Okay, good. Uh, this, this on its own, I think, invites the legend. Uh, there is no born on, no died on, no first name, no nothing to give you any kind of clue. It's an odd shape. I mean, this is one of those cemeteries that has all the great tombstones, too, the big monuments, the angels, the crosses, the spires, all that kind of stuff. So it's all got all the classic stuff you'd imagine you'd see in a cemetery, except for this ball, which is just out, out of the norm. So... Uh, I've, we've been out there numerous times as well, and a lot of the legends are hot. The ball's always hot. The ball's always cold. Nothing ever lands. You know, leaves don't fall on it, whatever. All that stuff has all kind of been debunked because it's positioned in the cemetery. It's made of marble. I mean, there's – but you can't shake the fact that it's an odd image in the middle of the cemetery. Um, there was some history to it. Like I said, the whole story about Martha Wise was – detailed in one of John Stark Bellamy's books. He does all those uh, Maniac in the Bushes and They Died Crawling, those Tales of Cleveland Woe. If you haven't got those books, go get them. They're awesome. One of his books, he details the story of Martha Wise poisoning all of her family in Medina. And I kind of gave you the highlights of that story. Um, And while it hasn't been proven, it is thought that it's conceivable that some of her victims might be buried at Myrtle Hill. I mean, it's a very, it's a big cemetery out there, but she almost certainly was not, and she certainly wasn't a witch. But the the tombstone, the area, the story, and the whole, like I said, the whole area out there beyond the the, the woods, beyond the the caretaker shed and everything, is creepy. You go out there, try if you go out in the evening before it's closed, you know, or it's not illegal yet or anything. And just on a quiet night, it's you hear weird stuff. I mean, it's uh, cemeteries are cool places anyway, um, and you can get a lot of weird vibes at them. But this one is really electric when you go out there, and I think a lot of it comes from that ball being there. Um, how many people have gone up there? Like I said, how many stories have been chemically enhanced? Uh, probably most. <laughs> but this is a this is a pretty good story. That it's it's. It's fun when you take a story that's been kind of added on to so many times and you trace it all the way back and you find that there was a kernel of truth. There was something there that actually that the story kind of deserves the rep it's getting. Where, where it was Unfortunately, you know, a lot of the, the a lot of the people are making up stories and misattributing it to the person who's buried there. Well, it's probably a family marker. I don't know who's buried there and I don't know if they have anything to do with it, but it's a fun trip nonetheless. I, I got a question. Uh, what are the what are the gravestone dates around the ball and does the dates kind of coincide with when this witch supposedly died in prison or this woman died in prison um no well we know that from what i remember from what i've read i mean that she died in prison early 70s okay. there are none literally no other there's no markings on this ball other than a last name You'd think if it's a family plot, there'd be other tombstones near it. There's not. It's just kind of all out on its own with no nothing. That's, like I said, why I think this kind of gets the, the attention that it does because it's so odd. There is another plot not too far from there but a good distance away, same last name, that does have family dates and names, mother, father, brother, daughter, whatever, you know, the whole thing. 
so I don't know if it's it's because of, you know it sounds like a German name. I don't know if it was fairly common back then. It might be un- unrelated, but I think it's probably related. I don't know why the ball stands there. The ball. I don't know what the ball is supposed to memorialize. Uh, I think the answer is probably available. There's probably people that can talk to can tell you who's buried there, if there is somebody, and why they picked the ball. But for whatever reason they did, they've attracted all this unwanted attention. But no, there's nothing on the ball. Other, there's a big marble ball and a last name, nothing else. All right. Well, you know what? Let's take a break here at number five, and then we'll count down and do the top five after this break. How's that sound to you? Is that okay? All right. All right, cool. And I know that you're an 80s metal fan, so I don't have much on here, but I got some slaughter for you, so I'll put on some of that. Very good. All right, it's from the Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey soundtrack. So, all right, cool. Yeah, and uh, we'll be back after two songs. All right. Okay. All right, cool. This is Joe Berry, and when I'm not on ProFootballTalk.com, I'm on Tokyo Radio. <laughs> Joe Berry. Yes. What, were you on ProFootballTalk.com? Today, yes, I was. <laughs> of course you were. on his phone right now, yeah. screwing up our Wi-Fi signal. Yeah, actually, I'm not on Wi-Fi here, so. Oh. <laughs> we're back. Uh, we're with Chuck Holly of CreepyCleveland.net going over the top ten most haunted spots. Uh, voted by everyone, by you guys, uh, in Northeast Ohio. So, we left off at number six, and now we're on number, wait, what? Number five. Five, five. Five. Coming in at number five, <laughs> Helltown. Uh-huh. Helltown came in with uh, surprisingly only about four votes. Oh. Not, not not a big turnout for Helltown, but enough to put it right in the middle. Uh, when darkness falls and black fingers of horror claw through this mist-shrouded valley, spirits of the dead rise from their graves. Satanic worshippers celebrate midnight candlelight masses in ch- county churches marked by inverted crosses. The screaming ghosts of murdered children ride for an eternity in a spectral school bus. Abandoned houses are haunted by mutant humans deformed by toxic chemical spills that force them from their homes. Motorists lost on lonely wooded lanes are dragged from their cars and slain by an axe-wielding madman. The lucky visitor survives being chased from the town by a vehicle with one headlight. Like many ghost stories, some of these myths are based on small bits of reality twisted into far-fetched fiction. Once passed along by word of mouth, they now move on and multiply with the speed of the Internet. So that's my spiel on Helltown. Helltown has got quite the the history uh, going back years and years and years. Uh, There's been, it was probably one of the more popular uh, story getters on Creepy Cleveland, it seemed to have been a, uh, a big tourist trap. I think it's most our destination, I guess, because the uh, the proximity of the ski slopes. But what happens, I guess, out there was the town is a sleepy little burg uh, nestled in the valley, and the I think it was the Metro Parks or, or the, the state bought a lot of the land. And from what I understand, the true story behind it, it was this kind of a sad story, that the state kind of moved in and kind of bought the land out from under a bunch of people, uh, leaving this entire area full of houses that nobody lived in. The whole town looked sort of abandoned. There was certainly wasn't abandoned. There was lots of people still out there. There was a functioning church. Uh, it had some Gothic architecture. It did have a number of unfortunate decorations that did resemble inverted crosses. Right. That's uh, while it was just sort of... Architecture, it, you know, the other people people took that for me being something far more sinister. Um, the roads out there really leave something to be desired. The biggest attraction back in the day, uh, speaking probably about 20 years ago, was the Highway to Hell. Uh, was out in Helltown. It was just past the Stanford Hostel. It was the road that connects uh, Boston Township to I think it's Route Eight. It ends out by Brandywine Falls, the falls out there that you can still get to. That whole section of road is now completely blocked off. It's completely untravelable. Hell, it was untravelable back then. That's what made it so exciting. But down the highway to hell, off to the right, was an abandoned school bus that had sat there for ages. Uh, I think somebody had determined at one point the true story behind it. But give me an abandoned town 
with a creepy old road with no lights, so potholed and everything else that you couldn't go more than five miles an hour, and then stick a school bus in the back, you know, in the back woods, and up. I'll invent a story that'll scare the shit out of you. <laughs> and that's what happened with, with Boston Township. A lot of people just sort of found the, the, the stuff that was there and made up their own stories. There's a, a cemetery out there that... Uh, one of the big stories that were going around, it was really weird, was that there was a ghost that sat on the bench in the cemetery. But what's odd is there's no bench in the cemetery. So people, are, people are, I'm still trying to figure out where that came from. That's got to be a, a story from another cemetery that somebody got confused with Helltown because it's not, there's no bench out there. LSD. But there's so many different stories. Again, chemical enhancement, yes, probably. <laughs> but so many people went out looking for a thrill and finding it. And I bet you the few remaining residents that were out there who did sort of want their privacy, there probably was uh, an old redneck in a beat-up truck with one headlight that took uh, took the chase and the kids out on the weekend and earned that reputation. Now, whether or not that was actually, any of this is actually true, if there's ever actually ghost or spiritual activity out there, remains to be seen. I think it's probably, probably no. But I can't you know, correctly say that it, it can happen. Uh, there's been lots of people out there that told me stories otherwise, but Helltown comes right in the middle of the list tonight as being definitely one of the creepiest, if, if not true, but one of the creepiest legends around the area. Have you ever been there? I, I've certainly been there. I, You know, I haven't been there in, God, I, mean, I was thinking about it today, 20 years. That sounds That sounds like forever. But it's been 20 years since we've been out there. And like I said, it's, it's, there's a, where the Brandywine and Boston Mills, both of the, the ski, the ski resorts are out there. So I mean, the place gets heavy traffic. The town is literally right across the street from those areas. So I mean, the place gets, gets heavy traffic like year round. But, uh, I haven't been out there and I certainly haven't been out there looking for anything, uh, recently. But yeah, we went, we did, we did the, the highway to hell and, with the best part was getting, you know, a couple girls in the back seat and scaring the hell out of them and telling them that out there in the woods that's where Jason lives and, and there's a school <laughs> bus and make, I mean, you make up some of the best stories and I don't know. And the word of mouth, like I said, by the time I started the website, I've mentioned it in a story or what something I'd mentioned it. Somebody wrote in it said, Oh yeah, when I was in high school, we used to go out there. And then somebody else chimed in, Oh, we used to go out there and somebody else said, I just went out there this weekend and, all of a sudden, I was finding all these people that have all been out there and they've all heard these stories, but of course, nobody knew the truth. And everybody's looking at everybody else going, well, what do you know? Well, naturally, some people started making shit up. Well, this is what I think I know. Right. The priests and the legends. I think, personally, there was a, an article in The Claim Dealer. Uh, I actually have that archived in Creepy Cleveland as well called Does Helltown Deserve Its Name? James Willis from Ghosts of Ohio kind of he didn't shame me. He didn't make me. He made me feel bad for me. He didn't come right out and out and attack me or anything. But he came. I came at the story. It was uh, one of the reporters from the plane dealer interviewed both of us separately. I came at the story like, yeah, it's creepy and it's right there and it's all this scary stuff and everybody's scared. And James came at it from the poor town that there's all these kids coming in and vandalizing and destroying their town and everything and kind of made me look at it from the other side and went, yeah. I guess I, I guess I understand that side of it, but he did bring up one interesting point that I, I do believe that I think out of all the stories on the list tonight, Helltown has probably gotten its biggest boost from the internet. I don't know of any other legend that's gotten more traction or had more details either made up or discovered than Helltown over the internet. The internet has been the medium that people have used to make. Helltown, the place it is now. I think if left on its own, without, a lot of, without an easy way for people to communicate, it would have, you'd have heard, heard a sporadic story here and there. But now that you've got the internet and people have smartphones and it's real easy, boom, boom, for people to take a picture or shoot a text or whatever, people are making up stories and corroborating each other's stories and creating this whole mythology for a town that probably doesn't deserve it. You know, and... I know that, you know, the, the one thing that stuck out for me, because everything, the one thing I always heard was the one headlight thing. And um, I know a kid that just went out there, what, uh, two weeks ago. I mean, so it, there's always a constant, you know, new generation of people going out there. Yeah, and with them remaking all the old movies and House at the End of the Road and all that kind of thing, people are looking 
for yeah. things like that. For things like that. I just remember right. hearing about the like teepee corn stalks in the middle of the road when I was younger. That oh, if you pass one of those, don't go past any of those teepee corn stalks. <laughs> well, I know I know the road going out. I, I wish I could. I, I probably should bring it up on Google Maps because it's probably out there. The road has a name, but if you go through the middle of town and there's a big sign that says uh, Stanford Hostel is off down this road, follow that road, it has a name, I just don't know what it is. Once you pass the hostel, I mean, there is a building out there that apparently is still in operation and whatever, but beyond there, there's nothing. And beyond there was the the way to the highway to hell, which is the road that did eventually connect to, out, out to Route 8, which, like I said, has been since shut down. So even more so today than 20 years ago, venturing past the hostel out there, that road, there's no point in plowing it repairing it, anything. I mean, the debris, the potholes, everything else that you would find out there. And it's not that, that that section that became the highway to hell is not, like, right behind the hostel. I mean, it's probably a mile further down the road. So, I mean, you're traveling quite a bit, no lights, no everything. And it's I, – I, I guess I can see where if something blew into the middle of the road or, hey, maybe somebody stopped and put something in the middle of the road. It would definitely be creepy. It's a, it's a perfect setup for that kind of uh, folklore or that kind of, you know, I'm going to set something up and create this sort of mythology because that whole, like I said, that whole area back there by that road is just, it's just begging for a story. And I don't know if, I don't know if there's one that's there, but, but maybe there is. It was like, uh, what was, um, that, that whole like lore of like the abandoned town and Jay, you cut grass and, uh, for Maple Heights, and you say that some of those uh, some of those streets they don't have anybody living on them, and it's yeah, it's kind of creepy just that, in the daylight. Well, not not as much Maple Heights, but like doing foreclosed houses down in Cleveland, uh, just and they're all old twenties houses and such, you know, and some older. It's just kind of it, it's sad and it's kind of weird that you'll have an entire block and there'll only be four people living in the houses so it's a it's a weird and that's creepy situation around there there's a lot of history down there and a lot of you know i found newspapers from 1973 the year i was born november 1973 with all the kennedy assassination stuff in these houses just you know in just between left. drawers and left and you know people moved in people moved out people moved in people moved out whatever and the stuff's still there because nobody bothered moving the stuff out. So it's it's strange and sad and weird and creepy, and you just get weird vibes inside the houses sometimes. Yeah, and that's 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 what I'm that's what I'm thinking too. And maybe the, that same type of uh, situation apply it to Boston Township. When you're when you're that kind of sad and you're that kind of creeped out and you're that sort of like looking around, nothing makes sense. You're, it's human nature to make it make sense. I want this situation to resolve. I want to have an understanding of why it is this way. And when no you know, no solution presents itself, well, we tend to make something up. Right. And like I said, with something like this, where it's like there's a ghost story or something else involved, uh, you get to find the lowest common denominator out there. You'll get a lot of people to corroborate the story and do it. And then pretty soon people feel superior or at least better that they're not afraid, they're not scared, they're not creeped out about this situation because now they have an answer for it, and even if the answer's wrong. Right. All right, well, let's moving on to number four. Oh. Number four, coming in with only five votes. Man, we're in the single digits. The next three, the top three really got the, uh, the votes, so stay tuned. But anyway, staying with number four, we have Gore Orphanage. Uh-huh. Now, my little notes, like I said, I did a little index card for each of these. Gore Orphanage, I started out my, my note card with uh, the definitions from the dictionary for gore. Gore is a noun, which means murder, bloodshed, violence, etc. It's also a noun that means a triangular tract of land, especially one lying between larger divisions. So keep that in mind, because there, was once, there once stood a place in Vermilion called Gore Orphanage. The orphanage was run by old man Gore, who frequently abused and mistreated the children in his care. One evening, a fire started in one of the dorms. Rather than help the children escape, old man Gore abandoned the building, leaving scores of helpless children behind to burn to death. 
If you visit, you can still hear the screams of burning children. Now, that's actually a direct poll, I believe, from uh, Dead Ohio. That's the, the probably the best uh, verbiage I could find of the legend behind Gore Orphanage. The truth is a little more sobering, that lying along a triangular tract of land, the swift, hollow mansion certainly experienced its share of bad luck. After selling out to Joseph Wilbur, Nicholas Swift's mansion became the center of a curious spiritualist movement. The Wilbers lost four grandchildren to diphtheria in the mansion. Joseph out outlived his wife, and when he died, the mansion fell into ruins. Near the turn of the century, an orphanage named the Light of Hope, or the Light and Hope Orphanage, was built on the land, and the mansion was renovated. By 1916, the orphanage had closed without incident, and therefore, and shortly thereafter, the remains of the abandoned Swift Mansion burned to the ground. So, in the case of Gore Orphanage, not only do you have a clue cool name, Gore, oh God, that's it's and Perfect. stick orphanage after it, you know there's a ghost story on that road. But the sobering truth is that gore was actually more of a surveyor's term. And there was, truthfully, an orphanage on the road at some point, hence the name of the road. So the, the name sort of becomes less exciting. But there was a mansion. There was ruins of a mansion. People go back there and they think they're seeing tombstones or they think they're seeing the remains of an orphanage. What they're seeing is the remains of the mansion, this old Swift mansion. No children lived in the mansion. It's a record that we're aware of. There was an orphanage on the land at a separate time that did house children, and I'm willing to bet children died there, but probably nothing nefarious, nothing that people, uh, no foul play is, is at least suspected. Uh, there was a fire. I think the mansion was burned to the ground well after it was abandoned. Um, there is a bridge out there, one of the well-known of the area crybaby bridges. I mean, Gore Orphanage, the whole area out there, again, uh, take a bunch of, take a sprinkling of truth, take a whole bunch of actual events that all happened at different times and compress them into the same time period and then wrap them up with a nice story and you've got another great ghost story to another great place to go out and visit. Now, I've said, I've, I've seen things on TV, I've seen websites and everything where people have gone out there real, quote-unquote, real ghost hunters with EMF meters and their whole deal and have actually tracked and found, you know, they've gotten readings. I don't know if I'd say there's, they've found ghosts or they've found spirits, but they've found evidence of something happening out there. Um, is it something that we've invented? Is it a mythology that we've all, like I said, taken all the, the facts that are out there and wrapped them up into a ball and then created ghosts out of that, that, that stew? Or is it something that actually was there, but all the facts are all mixed up? Gore Orphanage. Uh, has anybody been out there? Has anybody I, been? I that's out in Vermillion. That's kind of, Cleveland is kind of stretching. That's one of my further out ones. It really doesn't qualify as Cleveland, but I could not leave Gore Orphanage off the list. I went out to that bridge at one point. I remember we took a trip me way back in the day. I just remember a couple people went out there to that crybaby bridge or whatever and there's a couple different like stories behind why the bridge is named that and one was like some uh, a girl got knocked up and she wasn't supposed to like she was too young to be pregnant or whatever <laughs> so she threw uh, the baby off of the bridge and you can hear the baby cry which doesn't make sense to me because I mean whatever but then there was another one that uh, a lady had a baby and it was stillborn and she tossed it off the bridge the whole point is you can it, always hear that baby. Yeah, crying. you're supposed to go park on the bridge and then just, like turn the car all off and just sit there and supposedly you hear a baby cry. Uh, we sat there for like thirty fucking minutes and I'll tell you I didn't hear one <laughs> goddamn thing, but whatever. Well, you touched on now. This isn't uh, this isn't officially part of the list, but I can bring it in on that because there is a crybaby cry baby bridge in uh, in, in the Gore Orphanage site. But you touched on something with uh, the Crybaby Bridge, which is a totally... I, I couldn't add it to the list because my notes for Crybaby Bridge say that there are no less than 24 Crybaby Bridges in Ohio. Yeah, it's, I don't know um, if I went to the same one then, you know. Right, there's probably more. Rogue Hollow, um, Helltown allegedly has their own Crybaby Bridge. That's probably the more one. More Orphanage, uh, Wisner Road out in Kirtland, um, half a dozen other ones. I mean, those are some of the ones that I can remember off the top of my head. But every version of the Crybaby Bridge, and, I mean, this is this is Wikipedia stuff, 
Every version includes stopping or parking on the bridge to hear the cries of a baby or a woman who is mourning the loss of her baby who is drowned in the water either because she had to drop the baby in there or the baby fell or for whatever reason there was a death that occurred at the bridge that you're happen to be on right now. Um, other versions involve finding hand or footprints on the car as the child or the children try to save you from the same fate. They try to push the car. Then you cross over from Cry, Cry, yeah, Cry Baby Bridge to the uh, leg, the lower of the train tracks, where you pull onto the train tracks and put your car in, in neutral. Yeah, and, and they're supposed to. The push car will off. roll off the tracks, yeah. right? And if you look at the back of your car, you see little handprints, hand and it's the, the spirits of the kids who were killed by the train. And those two legends get get muddied up too, because it's very similar. It both has that that uh, helpful spirit of. Uh, Innocence, you know, the ghost who was innocent when the, the kid, the ghost of the kid or whatever is innocent and didn't deserve it and is there now to help you or is there now or whatever. But, um, yeah, Crybaby Bridge, like I said, there's one out in Gore Orphanage and they're all, they all share that same, every, everyone has a, has a different story, but they all are very similar to something. Sometimes the bridge is over train tracks. That's another variation. And every time the acoustics of the wind or whatever happens to be happening out there, with the running water or the train or whatever it happens to be underneath the uh, the bridge, all almost makes you believe I can hear it. I can hear people chattering. I can hear people crying. I can hear moaning. I can hear something. And you probably do. And like I said, lean over a bridge and, and try to hear the echo of the water off the the insides of the under you know the underside of the bridge, and you'll probably hear something. But is there any truth to any of these? Nobody knows. But it seems like every town's got its crybaby bridge, and Gore Orphanage is, is no exception. All right. Well, moving on. Number three. Number three. Coming in with 15 votes. All right. Big yeah. time. A lot of people tend to, and this time, this time of year, this place becomes very popular as well. Also, creepy Cleveland is kind of a stretch. Mansfield Reformatory, the Ohio State Reformatory, built between 1886 and 1910 and remaining in operation until the 90s, the Mansfield State Reformatory is well regarded by many as fertile ground for ghost hunting. Some of the most well-known haunted areas include the chapel, the warden's quarters, the Jesus Room, and the solitary confinement areas. Over 200 documented died in the, in, uh, the Ohio State Reformatory as well as a few guards who were killed during escape attempts. It makes sense that several people have experienced strange things there. The Mansfield Reformatory Preservation Society sponsors ghost hunts throughout the year. These are serious but informal attempts to document paranormal activity and the source of many photo contributions to Creepy Cleveland. In addition to the official ghost hunts, Mansfield also hosts a haunted prison experience on the weekends preceding Halloween. Often confused with the ghost hunts, the prison experience is a haunted house-style attraction through the prison following a predetermined path with the intention of scaring you. Now, I've only been to the uh, reformatory once, and it was a couple years ago, and it was for the printed prison experience. Um, just bringing up tonight's interview to a couple guys at work today, we were talking about it, and I checked their website. They're booked. They're, they don't do any of the actual, the real ghost hunting things during October. They turn everything over to their haunted house style. I, I'm willing to bet it's a big money maker. Yeah, they, they, do, they do more do, in the winter and towards, like, spring. They, yeah, they almost do. It's, according to the schedule for, like, 2012, it looks like they're going to do it year-round except for October of next year. Oh, but, wow. I mean, it looks like almost every other Friday or Saturday they're hosting something, and already they've got, I think, three sellouts for next year. They're that popular. Yeah. The, the, the first sell out at 100 people. So once they have 100 people, that's it. They're sold out. And they're so popular. I've got to get out there and do one of these. We should do... Uh, we doing should, weddings there and everything. Too. Yeah, we the ballroom still. Yeah, weddings. we should do a uh, a Type 3 Creepy Cleveland venture out. Everybody go. I'm so in for it. I'm up for it. Do like an event. I know. I've got, I've got a lot of... One of the big things that have kept us away is... Uh, my daughter's going to be 18, and the big thing on the site is you've got to be 21. And, like, I, I don't want to go. I want her to go. She wants to see this so bad. She went out with us when we did the, the haunted house thing. And the haunted house thing was good. I mean, it, they took, literally took you through the prison. You went through the, I think it's the E-block, the one with the six tiers. 
Um, you didn't go, I think you went up maybe second floor or third floor. It is beat to shit. I mean, I think it was, a lot of it was for effect, but a lot of it was real. I mean, the bars, the paint job, everything else, it is trashed. And, but, of they, course, you were, we went for the haunted experience, so there was people actually in the cells doing this to, um, to me on purpose. But, I mean, I can see walking around this place. This place is really creepy inside. Do they still have um, those, they, do they still have Andy Dufresne cell block in, like, I, I heard they restored a whole cell block for Shawshank. Do they? Is that still set up the way it was in the movie? I didn't see it. I didn't see it for the haunted experience. And I've read that I think after Shawshank they tore that down. Hmm. But I don't know. And I bet you more information could be found. The Preservation Society has their own website. They're the ones that do the haunts and uh, I mean the yeah the the regular haunts and everything, the ghost hunts, and they've got their whole history and all that kind of stuff. And I was like I said, I was just reading it there. I think today. Uh, is where I read that that after Shawshank that was torn down because they did what did, what else did they do they did Air, Air Force, Force One uh, Godsmack video <laughs> Godsmack video <laughs> and Little Cash a Little Wayne video yeah I mean there was a handful I think there was uh, six or eight different uh, events took place there and I mean it's still going now and the Preservation Society is trying to keep it from being you know completely torn down. Um, I mean, it was an operating prison in 1990. I think 1990 or 91 is when they actually got the word from the state that they had to they had to shut down. It was no longer uh, feasible. I don't know why. I mean, I guess looking at the place. Granted, it's been 20 years there too, though. I actually, looking at the place, I, mean, I, it's I actually done shit. I actually know a few people that uh, within the past like two years have gone through the prison experience. The, at, yeah. the, the haunted house, or the, no, no, not not the haunted house. The overnighter, they actually, the overnighter, and they said um, uh, the one guy. It's a married couple that um, I know, and they. Uh, he said that his wife was saying that she could feel something like walking next to her the whole time, but he was like, you know, I, I really he said like the whole time he was like, I, I I didn't believe anything anybody was saying. He was like, you know, it seemed kind of BS or whatever, and then. At the end, he told his wife, he was like, you know, this was a waste of money or whatever. And as soon as he said that, he said he felt something brush up across across the back of his head. And he said it freaked him the hell out. I was like, wow, dude. I said, that's kind of weird. I've heard. I've heard. The, I mean, I used to get uh, con- uh, pictures. I used to get a lot of contributions from a couple people. And I've got a lot of pictures. And some of the stuff's on, on the site and some of it's not. Um, I'm not. I mean, we could, I could, we could do a whole show some night on orbs. Whether or not orbs are ghosts or orbs are dust, I don't know what they are either. But I mean, I've gotten a thousand pictures of, of people from that people sent me from ghost hunts that have orbs in them, and I don't know what these little white dots are in these pictures. I mean, I don't know if these are supposed to be honestly something supernatural or not. But they tell me the story that goes along with the picture, which is far more interesting. That this room, when they were taking the picture, got very cold, or this room, when they were taking the picture, they heard they heard a weird noise. Or they heard a whisper, or they had their tape recorder on and they heard these noises, or it got very warm all of a sudden. And it's the same kind of stuff that you just said, that people experience, physically experience some sort of change when they're there. And the people that run these hunts, I mean, I guess they, they you, you check in at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock or whatever time, and you sign some papers or whatever, and then you are free. Why, you can why? go wherever you want, you can bring in whatever kind of equipment you want, you can, I mean, they have their money, and you're told that, you know, that it's a lot of steep stairs and everything. Be careful. And I guess you sign a waiver. But people have gone in there with, like, heavy-duty ghost hunting equipment and got results. And I, why not? I mean, it was a prison, I'm sure. That's probably one of the most haunted places I could, if there was, would be a prison. And that place it seems to fit the bill. Why uh, Why? Why do you got to be 21, though? That's my question. Uh the only thing I can figure, I mean, I thought 18 would be enough, but the only thing I can figure is it's the overnight thing. I know they don't serve alcohol. They actually, they serve pizza and pop as part of their deal. Yeah, that or like a um, hot dog and pop or something, you know what I mean? Like, right. So, I mean, it's not like it's an alcohol thing. I don't know if it's just a legal thing, probably because, I mean, when we went, like I said, when we went for the haunted experience, you were led along a designated path. I mean, you weren't supposed to veer off the path. But we did go right past cells and everything else. And, I mean, the paint coming off these cells, coming off these bars and the walls and everything, I mean, granted, it was it was good for effect, but you could tell that it was real. I mean, maybe it's lead-based. Maybe it's, I mean, if you're just wandering around there, you're running your arm across the wall or something, 
cut yourself. Yeah. I mean, you, I could see where somebody carelessly could probably get hurt, and that's the kind of person you want to sign a legal waiver saying you're promise not to sue us. Was that because a, he's, he's, in certain places this place kind of a shithole? Was that a capital but, pu- punishment? Eighteen would be enough to do that. Um, I don't know. That- I don't know if it was or not. I know they had solitary confinement, which is. I don't, I don't know if that's considered cruel and unusual, but I mean, that's like, that's something that they were known for, and that's allegedly also one of the more haunted parts of the prison was the solitary confinement rooms, but I don't know if anybody was ever executed there. I don't think so. I, it, it, it's it, it's going to be a haunted place, though, no. because, uh, I mean, it's gotten pretty major, like, all over. It was on Ghost Adventures. I don't really watch that show too much, but they did a whole thing where they went there, so I mean... If a major, like, TV network show is coming in to do, you know, some kind of show there and picking up stuff, because they caught a whole bunch of footage and... Hey, uh, yeah. uh, I found some on Mansfield. Go ahead. It's, it says, uh, 95 Death Row was relocated to the Mansfield Correctional Institution in Mansfield. The Death House remains at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility. Well, there you go. Yeah. Case solved. <laughs> Do you uh, you want you want to move on to uh, number two? I'm ready. All right, go ahead. Number two. I ruined that too. My bad. Ooh. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Number two has been mentioned already. Coming in with 18 votes, uh, just narrowly losing out to number one on the list is Franklin Castle. Now we've done a little talking about Franklin Castle already tonight. But to recap, the historical house located at 4308 Franklin Boulevard in Ohio City. The building has four stories and more than 20 rooms. It is supposedly the most haunted house in Ohio. Built for Hans Tiedemann, the house experienced tragedy after tragedy over the next 40 years or so. Deaths, mysterious and not so mysterious, plagued the family until Hans, the only living family member, sold the house around 1900. Since then, every owner has tried to make a go of the house in some way or another. A singing club, a speakeasy, medical practice were some of the early failures. During this time, rumors of murder and other terrors besieged the house. Secret rooms were found filled with Nazi propaganda, and bones of children were supposedly found under the foundation. Since the mid-60s, the house has changed ownership five more times, each new owner coming in with grand plans of renovation and dreams of returning the castle to its prestigious past. After sinking millions of dollars into the project, the castle has fallen victim to arson twice and is currently on the market again. Any takers? Now, like I said, this was just ironic that only recently has this come back on. We covered that earlier, that it is indeed back on the market. It looks like somebody else is looking to pick it up and going to try to turn it around. And it is a uh, a landmark in Cleveland. It is a historical... um, well, I guess landmark is the best word for it. I mean, it's, it's a place that you want to preserve. I'd, I'd hate to see something like that torn down. But, I mean, with a legacy like that going back more than 100 years, you've got to think that place is cursed. I think the best now, way... whether there's ghosts there or not, I imagine there probably is, but I, I don't think anybody's been in there long enough to, to find out. There certainly is something going on there when somebody, no matter what happens, I think the most recent one, uh, the most recent owner... Uh, Heimberger, Michelle, the one that bought it and had Charles being the caretaker, she was not really on her way to making something out of it until it was uh, it was set on fire. And that was allegedly set on fire by a vagrant. Uh, from what I understand, I don't know if he was and never charged or he was charged and, and did his time or whatever. I mean, it was, it did the, the, the fire made bigger news than who did it. But it seems like the, the, the guy, whoever did it, didn't, Set in, in, in motion another chain of events that created yet another in a long line of failures of Franklin Castle. I, I just, you know, I think that if you were to, you know, because they were going to open it and make, you know, I think he said like to stay the night and be part of the club was like $5,000. I think the best way to just make money off of it is leave it as it is and just let people stay there. You know, or have people come yeah, in and that's out. A, that's a lawsuit waiting to happen. I mean, how so? It's worse, worse than, you know, how do you get insurance for that? With yeah, I've got, I've got pictures on the site. Um, a friend of mine, Charles, back in, in May, in February or March, when we did our last thing, and we had Charles on, 
I was a little hesitant to mention some of the things that I'd heard, <laughs> and I'm not going to go ahead and do any kind of smearing now either, but I will say this, that uh, Charles had a, a, a history or had a reputation of hosting midnight tours in the castle that I guess you would find out about by being by friending him in MySpace. Um, between sometime between six and eight p.m., you'd get a notice on the on your wall that he was doing tours tonight at eleven o'clock. Bring twenty bucks and show up here, and you can pick a tour. And I guess this is what the way he managed crowd control. Well, regardless, it always seemed a little shady to me. But a friend of mine went, took his wife, uh, found out it was actually. On the up and up, I mean, he did provide them, you know, access to the castle, let them wander around, take pictures, do whatever. So my friend brought back a roll of like 200 pictures, and there was nothing. We went through these pictures with a fine-tooth comb, looking for any of the slightest irregularity or anything that could be like a ghost in one of these pictures. And the only thing I can, I can concretely say it in these pictures is the inside of that castle looks like shit. Everything ever since <laughs> the since the fire, that place has been gutted. The whole inside. Now, this is a few years back. I don't know if anything's been done since. But ever since the fire, the inside of that place is all bare wood. I mean, a lot of work has been done. You can see where they're where they're making, trying to make strides and putting it back together. But as of or as of the pictures I saw, it is not inhabitable by anybody. Hence, the reason Charles was staying in the in the carriage house, I suppose, because you can't live in there. I mean, I'm not even sure if electricity was working. There was wires and safety lights strewn all over the place. Um, I don't know if it had running water. I mean, I don't know if it had anything. I mean, this place was, between the fire and the renovations, it was totally gutted. As it sat just as recently as a couple of years ago, there's no way you could just say, let people stay there, because it's actually gone that far. Right now, somebody needs to buy that place and make it inhabitable and then let people stay there. I agree. I, I agree that the, it needs to be opened up. I'd like to see inside of it. I've been hearing stories and telling stories of Franklin Castle for 10 years, and I've only ever been to the outside and seen the outside of the castle. I'd love to see inside. But uh, right now, it's, it's just, just no way. It's, it's a safety issue. It's, it's, there's, they, they need somebody to come in here and dump some money into it and, and see if they can somehow avoid the curse and make it so it's habitable and then open it up and get a news crew in there and get people like, People like me, maybe. You can go in there and take some pictures yeah. and spread, start spreading the word that, you know, this place is, is back and it's, it's habitable again and check it out. But as of right now, from what I understand, it's, it's even worse than that. So how long before, like, uh, Anthony Sowell's house is on the list? You know, seriously. <laughs> you know, like, oh, it the is. Newer, it, you know, it, it is. Kids. What was that? I'm sorry? I've, I've heard, I, I've heard that there is, uh, a black market in uh, in souvenirs from his house. Um, during the whole trial, that place was under 24-hour surveillance just for such a reason, just to keep the people from going and getting his fly swatter or his rocking chair or his doorknob or whatever from the house <laughs> to say that I have this piece of history. Why would you want that? It's a piece of I history. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you got the you got the people who write... Uh, Manson, Manson's got fans that, you know, he receives mail in prison and everything. I mean, there's people that there's, that's their thing. That's what they get off on is it's for the, the, the lifers, the people who are on death row. They want to be their pen pals. They want to be part of that, uh, of, of a dubious part of history. And, and like I said, I, I happen to know that the place that Solo's house was under 24 hour surveillance all during the trial because they were afraid of that. I don't know if they caught anybody. I don't know if anybody tried it, but. I'm sure the fact that it's been done before is the whole reason they did it this time, to make sure people keep away from the house. Now that it's not in our 24-hour surveillance anymore, you're right. How long is it before that becomes the next Franklin Castle? That becomes the house down the block that has the haunted reputation and probably with a much better reasoning behind it than Franklin Castle. Yeah, I have uh, I heard that um, they're going to uh, just knock it down and turn it into like a park or something. That'd be horrible. I think they should keep it intact and charge admission, turn it into a museum, make some money for the city. Yeah. I mean, that's a sick way of thinking about it, but I'm sure there's weirdos that would go to it. So, What would you do with it, Jay? Uh, knock it down. Yeah. And do what? Just leave it? Bury it? Pile the rubble? Pile the rubble. 
smooth it over, plant some grass, <laughs> done. <laughs> I mean, that, Who wants to live next that, door to that stinky meat joint anyway? It, no offense, Jay, but if you're just going to knock down all the old abandoned shitty houses in Cleveland, you're knocking down half of the city. Blocks. <laughs> I mean, build a whole damn amusement park down there. You build a casinos. It, Let's go. Central Park ain't got shit on us. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> And well, let's uh, let's do a quick recap here, Joe. You want to go ahead and do that? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take the reins here for take a second. Take Joe Barry. All right, uh, coming in at number 10, we had Gray's Armory. Number 9, South Bay Bessie. Number 8, Squire's Castle. Number 7 was the Riders Inn. Number 6 was the Witch's Ball. 5, Helltown. Number 4, Gore Orphanage. Number three, Mansfield Reformatory. Number two, Franklin Castle. And here we go with. Hold on a second. I got to. See what? what are you? Oh, I got to. Let me. Just let me. Oh, you ruined it. No. What are you doing? Do it. <laughs> Hold on. Do it slow. Is that good? Is it on? No. No, it's not. On. Oh, here we go. Bubbles. It was the Monster Mash and I ruined it. Seriously? <laughs> the bubbles? Oh, horrible. Oh, that was horrible. All right. I guess. All right, sorry. <laughs> go ahead. No, All right. Ahead, I was trying to make it more. Oh, it's not. The, the suspense is gone now. All right. Yeah. All right. Number one. And the number one legend coming in with only 19 votes, but enough to top the list tonight. Of the creepiest legends in Cleveland is the legend of the Melonheads. Easily, by far, the most popular subject of, or the most popular topic of stories I received on the site. The Melonhead stories of Ohio are primarily associated with the area near Kirtland. According to legend, the Melonheads were originally orphaned under the watch of a mysterious figure known as Dr. Crow. Crow is said to have performed atrocious experiments on children, including inducing hydrocephalism, enlarging their heads. heads. Eventually, the legend continues, the children revolted against the mistreatment, killed Dr. Crow, burned the orphanage, and retreated to their surrounding forests, and supposedly feed on wildlife and anything they can catch. Legend holds that the melon heads may be sighted along Wisner Road in Kirtland. Many a visitor to Creepy Cleveland has spent a cold fall evening on Wisner Road looking for melon heads and more. More than a few have encountered unexplainable events, but so far no one has been able to prove their existence. Of all the legends in Cleveland, the melon heads seem to be the most pervasive and the most difficult to trace back to an origin. Like I said, it's easily the most popular topic on Creepy Cleveland. I get more stories about melon heads. More people have heard of melon heads than any other ever. I have never been to Wisner Road. Shame on me. I, but I know, ever since I brought it up, the last ten years I've been getting. I've been slowly, slowly but surely, I've been getting Melonhead stories. Of all, I've kind of cast every every story that I've gotten down into an index card, which I just read you. Everything seems to come back to this Doctor Crow. Doctor Crow, uh, a couple stories as a woman. Dr. Crow in a couple stories isn't a doctor at all. It's just an old man who is a kind old man. Some of the stories said he loved all the children, and but then he died, and the children were all mentally retarded or somehow, you know, not you know, handicapped in some way, and they turned wild because there was no one to take care of them anymore. Some of them said he was evil and he mistreated them, and they, they turned on him and killed him. But all the stories tend to agree that the melon heads are, truthfully, they kind of look like what I guess we believe the, the, the close encounters from the third kind of aliens to look like. They're short, they're skinny, they have big heads. Um, I guess they're bald. No one has said anything about a melon head ever having hair. They have dirty, ripped clothes, kind of like they don't have any. This is the only pair of clothes they've ever had, and it's constantly. They're, and they're, they're wild. They kill wild animals. That you can see them loping along next to your car on Wisner Road, like in the woods, or you see some movement, or way, way up, you know, just just out of the the, the uh, your headlights, you can see a movement across the road. I had to be a melon head. Um, but like I said, what's so curious about this one is how many people know about it, and how no one has produced anything close to any kind of physical evidence at all. 
people have sent me pictures of Lisner Road. They sent me pictures of a uh, of a stone that I believe that once used to be Doctor. It says the stone says Crow. I believe it used to be an address marker for where his house was or is or used to be. I mean, there's lots of little pieces of the story that click, and there seems to be some evidence. But no one, there's no, there's never been a sighting, and there's never been any kind of pictures of a melon head. Yet everyone seems to know about it. If you go on Wikipedia, you'll find that Ohio is only one of a handful of states that have melon heads. Melon heads are not exclusive to our area. But we seem to have, proudly, I think, we seem to have the richest folklore. We basically have the people that make up the most shit about it, I suppose. <laughs> um, everybody has been able to send in stories about um, one one says that a uh, mountain head ate his dog. I think that was my favorite. <laughs> one of the ones that actually is, I think one of that story was published in um, Creek, uh, what was it? One of the Ohio books, one of the strange Ohio books. There was just a blurb where a guy had posted that, you know, his, his dog was out in the backyard and the mountain head got him. So, I mean, the stories are out there. Nobody has any pictures. Uh, it's very creepy. Um, it's, uh, it's, it speaks of a whole tribe of people out there that are coming for us, and nobody seems to know why, and nobody seems to know how to stop them. So be careful in Kirkland. Yeah. There was a, a couple things that didn't make the list that kind of uh, shocked me. One of them was the Agora Theater. About. Oh. Really? Well, have and, you... and what had... Have you ever heard anything what about that one? Uh, I've heard. No, what's uh, well, obviously, first thing that's creepy about it that's real is that Marilyn Manson lived in the basement for a portion of the time, and then also uh, that there were uh, they used to have you know it was a ballroom. There was you know ballet, ballroom dancing, and that there was uh, <clears throat> some murders that happened under the stage and downstairs. It's on the Dead Ohio website, but. Uh, yeah, there was always some, uh, they've actually had, you know, ghost hunters come in and, as well and say that they had found, you know, psychic reading, you know, with EMF readers and stuff of that nature and, you know, gotten pictures with orbs and stuff like that too. But there, uh, there supposedly was, uh, some shenanigans going down at, uh, at the Agora Theater. You know, I'm, I'm seeing it now. I'm, I'm. It came right up under Google. I have never gotten a an Agora Theater story. Oh man, I, I, mean, I wasn't even aware of it. So you mentioned it right now, and that's well, you're right. I mean, it's all over the place. But yeah. that one, uh, no one has sent me anything. If you please encourage people, or, or even you yourself, if you got something, send in something so I can get that kind of stuff out there. That's I've never even heard of that. That's yeah, really interesting. And then Bob, you had one too. Uh, Jog Lake. What about Jog Lake? <laughs> I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I was going to bring it up, but I looked. I tried looking online. I couldn't find any information about it. So I think, what have you heard, though? I heard there was a uh, like a water wheel. I'm not sure what you call those kind of boats, but the casino boats that go out on the on the lakes and you could gamble on them. Was well, supposedly boat? yeah, riverboat. Supposedly one of them sunk with all the patrons on board. And that the actual park of Geauga Lake was haunted by the ghosts that were on the ship. Oh. Well, yeah, uh, here it says also on the Agora, it says, uh, on the main balcony viewed from the stage, cleaning crews have reported doors unlocking and opening on their own. So stuff of that nature happening, too. And like I said, I've been to the basement before for par- for an after party. Not an after party, but uh, some shows that uh, some bands I know that played there. And we went downstairs, and it is, I mean, it looks like, the photos that I've seen of the prison. I mean, it's just old, dirty, run down, but definitely something, you know, something creepy. And that would be some place that Mar- Marilyn Manson would have spent his early 20s at. So. I do, I, I read, I read his book. I read, what was that, Moving in his biography or whatever. Yeah, I read that and too. Marilyn Manson did spend time in Ohio as a, as a kid or whatever. I'm not sure if it qualifies as a ghost itself, but he's definitely creepy. Right. I just so, think it's, you know, of course he would live somewhere like that. That would be the place that he would of live. Of course. Yeah. Right, right. Joe, go ahead. I got one that didn't uh, make the list either, in uh, the Great Serpent Mound. Now, that's totally far away from Cleveland, but it is in Ohio. And 
supposedly a lot of crazy stuff goes on well, there. Isn't that more a, um, alien oriented than it, ghost? It, it is, but it, it's all paranormal in general because yeah. they don't know why certain things happen. I've actually you know, that happen. There. I've actually been there before. How is it? Is it kind of creepy? It's really or? weird. Like, um, it's just a huge mound. And, like, there's this, like, walkway, and you can go up, and, like, it goes up probably about, like, 30, 40 feet or whatever, and then you can just see down. It's, like, from, even from the balcony and from the ground, it's really hard to see what, you could just see the the ground raised up, so it's really hard to get the shape of what it is, but then they have, like, uh, like, boards with, like, aerial views and aerial pictures taken of it. And, I mean, to say I've been there, I mean, that's pretty cool. I, I, I It was and actually an interesting place. Another one is uh, the Ohio Grassman, which then deviates into kind of the Bigfoot legend of Ohio, but yeah. it's... That's ironic, because just this, just the last week, I think it was last week, I got, it's up on Creepy Clear, and it should be really just fine. It's one of the more recent ones. I got a story, Bigfoot in Astrobula. Um and it was, I mean, it did, it, it was the same thing. I was bordering between Grassman, Bigfoot, kind of. And, and read that one. That's a good story. This woman claims that, you know, she had big feet, big, big feet, big foot monsters in her backyard. <laughs> and, uh, big feet. And that was, I mean, the, when, truthfully, when I, back in, back in 2000, when I was first coming up with the site, I just made up the tagline, Folklore's Myths and Monsters in Northern Ohio. Because I wanted to have something, you know, to kind of go along with the creepy Cleveland. And at the time, I was thinking, when I was thinking monster, I was I was thinking South Bay Bessie. I was like, that's the only monster I knew of in Ohio. I never knew of any other monster. And since then, I've come to find that actually the legend of a, you know, a Sasquatch or Bigfoot in Ohio is far more pervasive than South Bay Bessie. People have heard of South Bay Bessie, and like I said, there was that one site that does seem to have a lot of details, but it's like one site. But there's dozens of sites that claim more of a, a possibility of, of a Sasquatch or whatever in Ohio, Allegheny Mountains type of area. So, uh, and like I said, how ironic that just recently I got a story that kind of uh, it goes along with that, and that's that's busted up there now. All right. Well, uh, I know that it's getting late. I, do you work for a shift? Like, uh, as you say, because I don't want to keep you up late. <laughs> So yes, I do, but no, I'm good. This is right about this is right about my normal time anyway. I had a wonderful time tonight. All right, cool. Yeah, and thank you for coming on. Um, what was that? Somebody said, "Nope, nope." All right, cool. <laughs> Everyone was looking at me like I was like, "Wait, wait, wait!" No, so, but no, uh, thank you for coming on again, and uh, thanks for uh, just doing this for us. I mean, it's always a good time. So. And, uh, no, not at all. Like I said, I put up a, a poll on the website, and we got people to kind of put their kind of the, the visitors to the site put the sites in the order they wished. Um, these are all based on stories that I've received. So there are stories for every uh, everyone, every one of the legends I covered tonight. There are stories on Creepy Cleveland. I'm still working on doing the search under and working exactly right, but they're all there. Uh, please send me stories. Uh, you know, like I said, with everything else, the stories we covered tonight, of course, I want to hear more of those stories, but the one-off, the really good ghost stories, that when you're sitting around a campfire drinking beer and one guy says, hey, you want to hear something? Then tell it to me. <laughs> Send me those stories. Right. All right. Well, uh, like I said, thanks again, and um, I, we will talk to you soon. And hang through uh, this quick song because I wanted to talk to you about something else, too, once we get off the air. Uh, and we'll, we're going to play two songs and then come back after this and wrap everything up for the night. Thanks again, Chuck. CreepyCleveland.net is the site. Send them your stories. And uh, Chuck's a good guy. He comes on and talks with us and shoots the shit, and he's not afraid. To, you know, he's, he's one of the guys, I guess. So, <laughs> all right, cool. Thanks a lot. Had a great time. What was that, Joe? I want to do the show about orbs and, and stuff. Oh, like yeah, that yeah, nature, absolutely. So. All right, cool. All right, uh, we'll be back right after this.